as well. So this is an on-the-record session. Uh, by design, we want to make sure that uh, we allow at least uh, 10 minutes uh, for Q&A at the very end. Uh, it's great to have so many uh, high-level participants in the first and second row, uh, and we invite you to uh, pepper our panel uh, with questions. Uh, welcome to the 2018 CNN Money Roundtable. This is the third year in a row uh, that we've decided uh, to put our spotlight on energy because there is such uh, great interest in the subject. I wanted to bring up a graphic of North Sea Brent going back to Davos 2016. Uh, some of those that are sitting in the aud audience know exactly what I'm talking about when we felt that period there at uh, January, uh, third week of January 2016 when we touched on Brent, $28 a barrel. Uh, WTI went down to $26 a barrel. And we've had some fits and starts, but if you look at the end of December 2016, after the alliance and agreement by OPEC and non-OPEC producers, uh, the trend line has been up, and then you get to the end of uh, 2017 again, the renewal of the agreement for another 12 months, so better than 20 uh, producers uh, signing on the dotted line to continue. There were plenty of naysayers out there, uh, but this was a fundamental shift to where the mentality is in terms of collaboration between Saudi Arabia and Russia and bringing the other producers uh, into a very solid agreement. But there are implications, and the kind of three major themes to focus on this evening is whether the Saudi Arabia-Russia alliance can stay glued together for all of 2018. Uh, number two, will the United States, according to the Energy Information uh, Administration suggests, have that production surge uh, throughout the year, maybe from 9.8 to 10.5 million barrels uh, over the next uh, 12 months? A and finally, we have a roundtable discussion tomorrow on the great uh, energy transformation. The amount of money that's going into the renewable space is averaging about $300 billion a year. Uh, but is it enough to dis start disturbing demand uh, for crude and uh, natural gas uh, over the next 10 years or not. We have a whole range of predictions, so it would be terrific uh, to hear from our distinguished panelists. Before we do so, I wanted to run some sound from two roundtables that I was conducting uh, in Abu Dhabi last week and at the Atlantic Council. We had the Arena General Assembly, which is renewable energy, and finished at the World Future uh, Energy Summit as well a broad-ranging topics uh, looking at the uh, transformation that I was talking about. We have a clip here from the Minister of Energy uh, from the UAE, uh, Suhail Mazrui, and also the Minister of State for Petroleum Resources uh, of Nigeria, Emmanuel Kachaku. Let's take a listen to what they think about the agreement that was signed at the end of 2016, and then we'll bring our panelists up. If we can roll that, please. We still have little bit more than 100 million, if we believe on, on the five years average, to be removed. And until we do that, I don't think we should, uh, we should uh, talk about the price a little bit going up. We, there is no need to panic. There is no need to do anything. Uh, even if the prices go 70 or a little bit above 70 for a day or a week, that doesn't mean that the whole year is going to be 70. Certainly, there's a collective resolve to do whatever we can, uh, collaboration, uh, multitasking, uh, relationship building, engagements, and obviously discipline in terms of uh, the decisions that have been reached by OPEC to try and protect that. Uh, but I don't think the philosophy is going to protect a price. Uh, I think the philosophy is going to protect a business model. Business model meaning we recognize the, uh, the, the, the impact of shale producers, we recognize the fact that there's competition for market share. Okay, so the thoughts of Emmanuel Kachaku and uh, Suhel uh, Faraj al Mazrui. Uh, I thought that was very interesting what the uh, Minister of State for Petroleum Resources in Nigeria suggested. We still have to look at the anticipation of the impact of the increase in U.S. Uh, shale production, and that's a topic, of course, we're going to address. Let's introduce each one of our panelists and give them a nice round of applause as they do come up. Uh, for the third time running, we're great to have him at the center of our debate and appreciate his support. His Excellency Khalid al Fale, the Minister of Energy. Uh, industry and mining at the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Uh, Mr. Afali is right here. <laughs> His Excellency Alexander Novak, the Minister of Energy of uh, the Russian Federation. <laughs> the U.S. Secretary of Energy uh, and the former Governor of Texas, Rick Perry. It's great to have you back in Davos. Thank you. His Excellency Dharmendra 
make sure I pronounce their last name, Pradhan, Minister of Petroleum and Natural Gas of India. And let's welcome back to the CNN Money Roundtable, Dan Jurgen, Vice Chairman of IHS Market and, of course, the distinguished author of uh, the energy business. <laughs> Gentlemen, we have uh, about 56 minutes, so plenty of time to debate. We want to save about 10 minutes for uh, discussion from the very distinguished panelists. There's going to be people coming in because of the finishing remarks, as I had noted before, from. Uh, uh, President Macron as well, and I think there's a few journalists in the audience uh, that we should be aware of as well. Uh, there's going to be a simultaneous translation for His Excellency uh, Minister Novak, who's going to be speaking in Russian. So please have your uh, translation uh, devices near you so uh, you make sure you can pick them up from the very beginning. Thank you very much. I, I think it would be apropos, if we can, to start with uh, Secretary <coughs> Perry. Uh, you heard from Emmanuel Kachuku at the very end of his comment there saying, we have to look at the dynamics. We can't overreact as OPEC, non-OPEC producers and start uh, adjusting the, the agreement that's in place right now. Uh, but it's seen that uh, shale and U.S. production, uh, Mr. Secretary, could be the spoiler in 2018. Uh, can we believe the estimates of going from 9.8 million barrels a day up to, say, 10.3 or 10.5 million barrels a day? That seems like it could be a spoiler. It's quite a, it's quite a step. Uh, but I think it's always important. I like to refer people back to um, a little over a decade ago, and um, he may have even showed up here in Davos, a young fellow by the name of uh, Matt Simmons, who uh, made a pretty good living traveling around the world, giving a speech, talking about peak oil. Fatih, you re remember, we had found all there was, and, and that was it. We needed to, to be transitioning and what have you. And I always try to remind everyone the technology and uh, you know, innovation around the world can really turn all of this on its head very quickly, as I think as, it, as it's done. Uh, to directly answer your question, I, I don't particularly think that it is going to be a spoiler, the American shell uh, production, and partly as we were speaking earlier, that there's a lot of reforms going on in the world, certainly in the kingdom with uh, uh, what the crown prince is, is doing there. Uh, you think about Mexico and the reforms that are happening, uh, Minister Pradhan, and, and what's happening in India. And, and I think that the, 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 those reforms have the potential uh, to really drive uh, consumption, uh, to drive innovation. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer that uh, uh, the best days are in front of us. Yeah, what do you think of this idea, though, that because of the restrained production from both Russia and Saudi Arabia today, because of the agreement they've uh, uh, collaborated with, uh, it allows an open door for U.S. production to surge. And do you agree with the numbers from uh, the EIA today of going from 9.8 perhaps to 10.5, partially yeah. because of demand, partially the market needs it, but is that, are you in agreement with those numbers that we're seeing? Well, certainly, uh, you know, I, I, I would like to stand here and tell you that the numbers are absolutely correct. Uh, my friend Harold Helm might say, well, you might want to take another look at those. Uh, but, the, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the fact is the numbers are what the numbers are right now. Uh, but again, I don't get too uh, spun up that uh, the, the, the world economy cannot uh, absorb what uh, that we're producing um, globally. Okay. I would like to bring up a graphic, actually, from the EIA, uh, not to just to look at 2018. I think that would be incorrect if I, I did so. Uh, this is from the IEA, looking at uh, U.S. production going back to 2009 and all the way up to 2021. Uh, to be fair and clear, these are all U.S. products. So we're not just talking about oil here. So uh, over 7 million barrels a day to perhaps uh, 14 by 2021, and that's all products here. Uh, Minister Alfale, that's pretty substantial. Uh, does that uh, keep the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia just a little bit worried about what we see in the market today? I think, John, uh, you have to put it in context. If you go back to the 1970s, the U.S. Uh, production of crude oil approached 10 million barrels, if my memory serves me You're correctly. Right. I, was, I was much younger back then. And uh, the world demand and the global market was much smaller. Uh, and yet there was enough room for, uh, for the rest of the producers. So for the U.S. to regain and even to exceed some of its uh, you know, market share in a much bigger market 
uh, doesn't uh, necessarily present a threat to other producers. I think you also have to look at this in the context of what is happening elsewhere. If you look at the Americas from Canada all the way uh, to Brazil in the south with Mexico decline, Venezuela decline, uh, you'll find out between 2014 and 2017, despite all um, you know, of, of, of the talk and um, about shale and, and, and this revolution and, and you know, uh, the, the, the tectonic shift it's creating and game changer, the America's production is actually flat. You know, within 100,000 when I looked at the numbers. This is over a period when there has been significant growth, but decline elsewhere. So I think we need to think of, of, of the globe in totality. There is growth in demand uh, of one and a half million barrel, give or take, over the last few years. We've grown since this down, downturn, about five million barrels in demand. We're approaching the century mark of 100, 100 million barrels per day for the, obviously for the first time in history. And I don't see signs of significant slowdown. Uh, that ultimately will need to slow down uh, because our, it is, it is uh, a finite resource that we're talking about today. But it's going to grow at a healthy rate, between a million to a million and a half for a few more years, and then it will, it will uh, decline a little bit. So I am thinking that uh, in the next 25 years or so, we're going to see another 20 million barrels of demand we're going to hit 120. I remember here, probably in this room, where one of my colleagues back then said, we're going to peak at 95 million barrels of demand. And here we are talking about 100. So I don't think we should worry. Uh, obviously, the oil market is very sensitive to inventories. We saw that two years ago. And if we don't keep our eyes on the inventory, we could go out of balance. But in the long term, it's a very healthy, market and I think we can accommodate the kind of numbers that are coming out of the US uh, even if they are as bullish as that chart shows. Aren't you getting lucky though to be honest with you because you had this huge disruption coming from Venezuela and some of the other Latin American producers. It's just fortunate as the US starts to rev up that Venezuela is stalling horribly as an OPEC member because of the political dislocation there. If you didn't have that it would be a different game, correct? But that's the nature of the market. I mean, I think after Venezuela recovers, and we wish them the best, they're, uh, you know, they're a member of OPEC, and we have good relationship with them, somebody else, unfortunately, may start declining. So I wouldn't, uh, you know, I wouldn't say that everybody is going to be on plan. And if everybody is on plan, which is a good thing, I think we just need to be careful about managing our production. I think the uh, leaving it free for all and, and, um, and, and, and just pushing production to the max. We tried it for a couple of years and uh, everybody felt the pain. Uh, certainly all of the producers felt the pain, but in 2015, uh, even consumers, because of the secondary impact on demand for industrial goods, on, on, on the global economic indicators like deflation, like low interest rates, even consuming countries, were complaining about the state of the oil industry and calling on us uh, to do something that is good for producers and consumers. So together with Minister Novak, with OPEC, with other producers around the world, we came together and we created a framework that required a little bit of sacrifice, if you want to call it this, and cutting production between three to 5% amongst the countries and we've seen uh, the recovery in the oil market to everybody's advantage. Okay, let me follow up with uh, Minister Novak then. I, I interviewed you right after the close of the uh, meeting in Vienna on November 30th, and you said if this price starts to creep up, we may have to rethink what we've signed on to for all of 2018. We're almost at $70 a barrel for North Sea Brent. Uh, do you think it's time to revisit and be a little bit more cautious and not leave a, a huge vacuum for uh, the U.S. shale and, and uh, traditional producers to take your market share? <coughs> Thank you, John. First off, I'd like to follow up on what my esteemed colleagues said. 
what the minister said about the shale oil. I would also like to cite a couple of arguments, but I fully agree with everything they said. We should not be afraid of shale oil production in general, in the general energy mix and in the general supply and demand on the market. As my friend Halid said, we have 100 million barrels a day. This is the market demand as it stands today. And shale oil is 5.7 million barrels of shale oil per day, which is 5-6%. Even if they add 6 more million barrels by 2021, as you showed it on the slide, well, this will add 2-3% to the overall demand. So you should understand that this is merely one way of satisfying the market. There may be many different ways of producing oil. There can be shale oil, traditional oil production, deep water shelf, Arctic shelf. There are so many different ways. We should also bear in mind that every year to sustain the existing level, even for that, we need to restore our production at a 4 to 5 percent from the existing level. And this is a huge investment that the market demands. So we do understand that given a higher price, certain projects will become more profitable, for instance, such as the shale oil project in the United States. But we are not worried by it because we understand that over the long term we need to meet the growing demand. And apart from having losses that our annual production sustains, we will need at least 10 years to increase our production. So we need to ensure that projects are implemented to provide 20 million barrels of oil per day for the next 10 years, and maybe another 10 million to cover the growing demand, or maybe even more, 20 million, as uh, Mr. al Falik said, that he's expecting that in the next 25 years, the growth is going to be up to 20 million barrels per day. And this is a huge figure, and we'll have to put a lot of work into it. And the deal that we've reached between the OPEC and non-OPEC producers that was concluded under the leadership of the minister from Saudi Arabia, and we had other non-OPEC nations on board. So this deal shows that the countries, in order to achieve their goals and in order to balance the market, they are ready not only to overcome economic difficulties, but also political difficulties. It was really difficult to reach an accommodation there were other political disagreements in place, not economic, but political in nature. And the fact that 24 countries have reached this accommodation goes to show that this tool is efficient, it works, and it can be used in the future. Finally, as far as the prices are concerned, we don't see the price today as the main criterion for achieving the results that we have enshrined in this deal. Our main objective, and we have discussed it with the ministers that took part, in negotiating this agreement. Our objective is to remove the surplus from the market, and this objective is slowly but steadily being implemented. We can see that the result is nearly in hand, and so all of our subsequent actions will depend on that, but not on something that we see in a short-term perspective, higher prices perhaps. Although this factor should play a role and be taken on board, but the key fundamental indicator is the surplus oil on the market and the supply and demand balance. Okay, let's uh, do a quick follow-up with you, if I may. That you're not overly concerned about the price, but I know the Russian producers are worried about the volume that they're holding back off the market here uh, to support this agreement with Saudi Arabia, uh, your good self, and the other OPEC and non-OPEC producers. Uh, aren't you acceding market share to the gentleman to your left to let them kind of rev in off of the sacrifice of the uh, 24 producers that you're suggesting? Is it the wise strategy over the long or medium term? Considering that the overall balance is shifting and it's shifting for the better, we are emerging from this historic crisis that has dragged on for many years. And even if we consider the shale oil production, the overall balance is positive. And we can see that the demand exceeds the supply, even in winter period, even though we usually uh, had higher risks because we thought the demand would be lower. But even during the winter period, we can see that surplus is reduced on a weekly basis. We have 
seen this trend for the past several weeks, so we believe that this situation is positive also for our economies and for our companies. Naturally, every deal will run its course and will end at some point, and we'll have to go back to a market situation. So we also believe that depending on the balance between supply and demand, that the key would be fair competition when it comes to production, when it comes to downstream, both in the oil and in the gas sector, and in any sort of activity. And so we are in favor of avoiding protectionism. We are in favor of fair competition, whereby the consumers and the producers will have a win-win situation where the producers could meet the growing demand and provide enough supply. Great. Thank you very much. Let's bring in uh, Minister Pradhan. Uh, the Secretary of Energy was talking about your reforms. Uh, we see demand, as Minister Alfali was suggesting, rising to about 1.5 million barrels a day, and it's been pretty consistent. A million of that, by the way, is coming from uh, Asia itself, and that would include uh, India. How long does the demand for traditional oil and gas remain strong? You're almost importing five million barrels a day, because we often talk about this energy transition. Prime Minister Modi talked about the investments into renewables. Is this going to continue rising at this pace for the next five years? John, let me uh, put some bare facts. How do you analyze? IEA has some observation on our consumption. Today, our consumption is uh, around uh, 200 million metric ton per annum. Today, my refining capacity is around 247. IES observation on our market is by 2040, our requirement will be up to 500 million metric ton. We know the emerging uh, technology on renewables, and India is heavily, Prime Minister Modi is very focused on one area. We have positioned ourselves, uh, we'll add on 175 gigawatt of renewable energy by 2022. We have to have a balance in our own basket. I can predict for the next uh, 20 years, India will be depending on conventional energy, the fossil fuel, hydrocarbon, the all our reliable partner in this journey, starting from Kingdom, Russia, and recently we have started uh, receiving the cargoes of shale oil from America. So we are we are we, we are depending, we are we are a consuming country. The next IES, another observation on Asia, specifically on India, is for the next 25 years, the incremental requirement, 25% of incremental requirement will come from India. Our growth, our per capita energy consumption is very low. We are a growing country, we are a developing country, we are a young nation. I am a strong believer. My requirement is going to, bound to grow, and sizable of that growth will meet out by conventional sector, and I will continue to depend on this import. And being a consuming country, I was listening to the different argument, the balancing, you use the term disruption, I will use the term the balancing, whether it is shale oil, whether it is our reliable friend from kingdom. My expectation as a consumer will be, the price should not pinch our domestic economy. We must appreciate more capex on exploration and production area. So the producing country also look into the interest of consuming country. This balance must be the finer, the finer point, the main point of the production balancing. OK, very good. Uh, what do your forecasts show us, Dan, in terms of demand uh, holding up? We're at nearly 100 million barrels a day. Uh, we often talk about this onset of peak demand, and I see a huge range of uh, expectations. Well, uh, we know where Minister Alfale stands. You know, Where's your head today um, in early I, 2018? You know, I find it very ironic. On the one hand, this discussion about peak demand, which is sort of shifted into discussion about transition. On the other hand, we're seeing about as strong demand as we've ever seen in oil. And you kind of say, this year, last year, we added 90 million new cars. Uh, about 99% of them were gasoline-powered cars. So in terms of when there's a peak or a plateau, at least based upon what we see today, it's not tomorrow, it's not next week, it's not next decade. Maybe it's around 2035, 20, 2040. 
uh, and it's going to be at a higher level than we are today. Okay. Would you agree with the minister that we're looking at a range of 120 million barrels a day? Or is yeah, that we, we, could, we could be looking at that. And remember also, on top of that, we have declines. So there's a lot of oil that has to be replaced. So uh, there's a lot that has to be done to meet the demands of growing nations and, uh, and uh, the, the big consumers today. Let me put you on the spot a little bit here. Does the recovery that we're talking about uh, in the United States spoil the rally? Because well, we've, no. we've gone from 60 to almost 70 after the OPEC agreement, as you know, in, uh, with the non-OPEC players at the end of November. Well, it's, it's, it's so interesting how markets can change so quickly. Not so long ago, $60 was a target. Now it's a floor. And it's really turned around rather fast. I think you look, we've never seen such bullish uh, positions in the financial markets, which I think are certainly uh, part of what's happening. Uh, so, you know, so it's run up very fast. It's a the, the market shift. But, I, you know, we'll see what happens over the course of the year. But probably not going to see prices remain like this uh, for the whole year. Uh, what does that tell us? Well, it's still, that I still, lower or higher, if well, I can put you on the line? <laughs> uh, what's the they're, they're, I know they're not going to remain exactly $69 go a barrel. Down, I think that's pretty good. Not necessarily in that order. Uh, I think uh, when, if, if nothing dramatic happens, I think, uh, I mean, we'll see this uh, large shale uh, component coming in. Uh, and, you know, it's maybe reasonable to think about as instead of a $50 to $60 world, a $60 to $70 world uh, over the course of, of this year. So and and particularly, the other 50 thing to is, 60 is a range you're suggesting. Yeah. The other thing to remember is, you know, or high 50s, remember, uh, look at the optimism here in, in Davos in terms of the economy. Optimism is embedded in the snow, and that's because of the strong economy. So that's what's also driving uh, the demand right now. Okay. Let's uh, have you pull out, you were digging through your notes, uh, <laughs> Minister Alfale. What are your thoughts about the year? Can you protect 50 as the, the floor for 2018 or not? Protect what? The floor of $60 a oh. barrel. I knew you heard me on that. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you said, John, I thought you said 50. You said 50, it scared me. <laughs> no. You work you so know, hard, you don't want to give up 60, act right? Actually, uh, you know, actually, we didn't target 70. Uh, we didn't target 60. We, uh, as uh, Minister Novak said, uh, we, we have uh, a fixed, uh, you know, target, which is to bring uh, balance into the market. Uh, inventories is the main indicator of that balance as well as supply and demand being essentially uh, in line and we're not there yet. Uh, price is, a, is, is, is a, uh, an outcome and, and not an input. Price will be the outcome of reaching that balanced market and the market will balance around the price that brings enough investment flows enough to meet the incremental demand that we've been talking about today, as well as to offset the decline. The combination of incremental demand and decline is upwards of 4 million barrels a year, mm. year after year after year. And it goes more as shale takes up more of the slack, because its decline rates are higher than conventional oil. But th that is going to require going back uh, on, on, on investment. Investments used to be annually in the area of $700 billion uh, four or five years ago. It's gone down by more than half. It's increased, I think, by 7 8% the last year. And 2017, we haven't seen a significant flow. So the price signals obviously are not enough for, for investors to start putting the kind of projects that will meet the incremental demand that we talked about and to offset the decline. And we need to give it time for that to happen. So this could be a boomerang, though, so if you lack lacking the investment. Uh, we should be talking about a downward trend in prices with the new U.S. production uh, surging. But uh, a rise in, in a price if this uh, investment doesn't trickle in in 2018? Well, the kind of investment I'm talking about are the long cycle projects, which will take five to seven years yes. to, to bring the fields on production. You know, the, the most bullish estimates are, are going to give you uh, 500 to 800,000 year on year. And I question the sustainability of that from geologic, from supply chain, from marketing, from outlet, from investment flows. We, time will tell. But even if that happens, talking about four to five million barrel totality annually, uh, comprising both incremental demand and decline, 
I don't think it's enough. So I don't lose sleep over it. I, I think it's necessary. Uh, and we just need to be careful that we, we don't go out of balance for a few months and co cause the glut to surface again and the markets to overreact. And that's where having the framework, uh, you know, being a continuous framework between OPEC and our partners from outside OPEC so that we keep our eyes on the ball constantly and, and, and manage this, this market, this fragile market, uh, delicately and, and, and stay on course. Good. Uh, do you have buy-in, as you were suggesting at the end of the OPEC meeting, for all of 2018? Are you going to have people in June uh, of your membership going, look, you know, this price is uh, too high. We should go back to the drawing board and ease back a little bit. I don't think people are going to complain about price. I, <laughs> I, think, I think people may fear uh, that the price will trigger slowing demand and uh, a flood of uh, supply from the source we've been talking about, which is shale. We will have that discussion. I mean, it's a highly hypothetical uh, situation. From what I've seen, and we just had a meeting in Oman with with the member countries, everybody is focused on staying the course until 2018. We're going to have a week-long gathering in Vienna in June. We will review uh, the monitoring committee report, the technical committee report, the OPEC secretariat. We'll look at the forecasts from agencies like the IEA, the USEIA. We'll have a conference uh, for, for the Vienna seminar, I mean, the OPEC seminar in Vienna. All of these will be good data sources for us to just see which direction we're traveling and make sure we're on course. But I, I think it's highly, highly uh, unlikely that we will change and, and, and uh, exit. I think that will be the time probably to uh, fine tune what is the target? What is an appropriate <coughs> normal stock level? When we talk about five year, uh, which five years? Because mm. the running average five years up to 2017, for example, include some pretty inflated inventories for the last two years. So I think we have to sit down and understand what the market needs in terms of inventory, set that target carefully, uh, and, and then look at the uh, trajectory for the second half of the year, and start talking about a gradual smooth exit so we don't shock the market during the low demand season in 2019. Okay, uh, Secretary, uh, Perry, let me bring you back into this. This is a, a subject that uh, Minister Alfale touched upon. A lot of people don't think, and when I had the chart up there, going to 2021, the surge, but by 2025, the U.S. can't sustain that level of output. Uh, give us a, a taste of what you think. Yeah. Does it all peter out and it's over-aggressive Americans just going after whatever they can I, uh, in the time being, and, and then it, uh, it starts to decline at the second half of the decade? I like to remind people of my remarks when I started and uh, that uh, uh, we shouldn't buy into uh, these terrible numbers that say, oh, 2024, 2025, we're going to run out of oil. Because the fact of the matter is that uh, the technology that we uh, may see in the pipelines. Uh, but I, I want to go back to, uh, to talk about uh, uh, feast is better than famine. And I recall famine pretty good back in the mid-70s and, and what it did to the global economy. And I think it's really important for the, the individuals sitting on this stage and the fossil fuel producers and, and what we are doing, our countries are doing, what those producers are doing out there uh, to give opportunity to uh, the world, uh, particularly in, in, in some of the countries that haven't had the opportunity to to grow on the manufacturing side, that the, uh, the, the opportunities for their citizens. And, and, and that is a, a great and a good story. Mm. And I know it's interesting for us to sit here and speculate what the price of oil is going to be or the volumes are going to be. Uh, but I will suggest to you that for the, for, the, for the global community and for the prosperity of the global community, it's very important for these countries, particularly these fossil fuel producing countries, because th that is what is going to drive so many of our economies going forward. Uh, as we develop our renewables, as we look at the alternatives that are out there, whether it's nuclear and having that, uh, again, be back uh, substantially in the mix. But I think it's so important for the, for the global community to understand that the fossil fuel producers 
and what they are making available for uh, better quality of life and for opportunities are, are, are what I'm really interested in. It's why uh, that uh, Minister Alfala and uh, Mr. Novak and Pradhan and I are, are very, uh, you know, we're blessed to be in countries with uh, pretty substantial ability to deliver to the people of the globe a better quality of life through those fossil fuels. Good. You almost finished your answer, though. I just want to go back into you have the concern that because of the price we see today, the investment is flowing back in uh, to the shale sector. But overall, that we see this surge up and then it declines more rapidly than it should. It's not being managed uh, with the kind of the discipline we have here because it's a free market. So what happens over the next uh, 12 to years in your, your view? To answer your question in a simple uh, one word, no. Hmm. I don't have a concern about that. And why not? Well, I don't have concern about it because I think that the market uh, has the ability to uh, uh, respond to this. And, 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 and I think when we have a, uh, a bit of a surplus, is, is, you know, a, a bit more feast right now uh, than we do famine, that that's good for the, you know, I think that's good for the globe. Okay, very good. Uh, let me follow up with uh, uh, Fatih Birol, who just got... Uh, re-elected as the executive director of the International Energy Agency, which is good news. Uh, he has a microphone. He's uh, sitting in the front row to participate here. Give us a sense of the tipping point, because we talk about peak demand. But when's the tipping point from renewable energy investment start to hit demand for fossil fuels? What's the, what are the IEA surveys showing us today, Fatih, if you can weigh in on this? And we had this conversation in Abu Dhabi. Uh, as you recall, in, in the three roundtables we're involved Every, in. Everywhere this question, mm -hmm. big demand question. But before that, let me just mention something some of the colleagues mentioned, the shale revolution. Is it real or not? Uh, since some of the colleagues questioned the shale revolution's effects, as somebody since 2009 highlights the shale revolution, it is possible implications. And I call it at that time, 2009, the silent revolution in my view, which became very, very loud now, just two numbers. In terms of gas, shale gas, only a few years ago, United States was ready to import a lot of LNG. And today, United States is the number one gas producer of the world. This is shale revolution. Number two, in terms of oil, I think shale oil production today is about six million barrels per day. These are concrete barrels. And this is the reality. And I think if we can put US together with Venezuela and Mexico to give a, a, a different picture, I don't think that it is a right analysis to understand the shale oil dynamics. Now, <coughs> what it is not is the following. United States will not be the largest oil exporter of the world. Saudi Arabia and other many Middle East countries will continue to meet the growth in oil demand in Asia and <clears throat> elsewhere. Because all this oil production in the United States will be, bulk of them will be used in the United States. And some of them will be exported, but the biggest exporters we see Saudi Arabia and other Gulf countries. Now, having said that, I believe shale regulation is coming and very strongly, and we will see more and more impacts of that in the next years to come. When it comes to demand, I mean, the Electric cars discussion, as uh, uh, colleagues mentioned, and the peak oil demand came at the same time, the debate. Now, to be honest with you, since 2014, when this discussion started, global oil demand increased more than 6 million barrels per day. And not only that, more importantly for me, the share of oil in the global energy mix also increased. So therefore, uh, I do not see that the electric cars alone will lead a peak oil demand because the, all the cars today, passenger cars, constitute only 25%, one-fourth of the global oil consumption. The growth is coming from trucks, from jets, uh, from ships, and most importantly, from petrochemical industry. So therefore, uh, we believe at the IEA, the oil demand growth may slow down, but it will still grow, so therefore we need the oil coming from all these three countries, from U uh, US, from Russia, Saudi Arabia, and others, to meet the growth in the demand, 
and compensate the decline in the existing fields. So okay. we shouldn't give wrong uh, signals to the investors. Okay, Dan, in fact, in the, if we look at the pace of disruption today that's taking place, and you just look at the digital disruption or uh, an Uber that's in the market or the introduction of the smartphones over the last uh, 10 years, are we gonna wake up and say, boy, that panel was just really sleeping through a major disruption that the investment going well, into renewables well, is high. First of all, electric car first introductions all, are going to be very strong. First of all, uh, in terms of uh, demand for oil, fuel efficiency standards are going to be more important for the next couple of decades than electric cars, I think. Secondly, um, you're confusing, or not you're confusing, but there's a tendency to confuse renewables and oil. With renewables, you're talking about wind and solar, you're talking about electric power. You're not talking about the uses of, of oil, and that's an important distinction uh, to keep in mind. Uh, I think the third thing to, you know, and just to think how much this world has changed. As we're sitting here, I'm thinking uh, how the world's changed. The Minister Pradhan's uh, home state has, was the first state in India to receive U.S. oil. Uh, U.S. is exporting LNG to India. Meanwhile, we've been wondering whether this cargo of Russian Mm -hmm. molecules of gas are going to arrive in Boston. It's about to arrive, not arrive. It's pretty amazing that that would be happening in terms of LNG. And just one other thing to keep in mind about how sort of striking this is, uh, you know, Secretary Perry uh, was, uh, Texas is not only a big producer of, of uh, oil, but it's also the biggest producer of wind. But just to think what's happened in one state. Uh, eight years ago, Texas was producing one million barrels a day. Today, it's producing almost four million. If it was in OPEC, it would be the fourth largest producer. Yeah, indeed, you could put it in into the ranks. So you don't worry about this tipping point that we're addressing here with Fatih. No, I think it's. I think we're going to see obviously more investment. We're going to see an electric power system in the future where the investment looks like it's going to be large. It could, still, people are putting coal in nuclear uh, in uh, Abu Dhabi, uh, but we're going to see a tilt towards two things: renewables and natural gas in terms of electric generation. That's what looks ahead there. Cars will be more efficient. There'll be governments are pushing electric cars. But there are other things that are happening in the automobile fleet too. Autonomous vehicles, uh, ride hailing services. So it's a mixture of a lot of different things that's gonna happen. And undoubtedly in some ways, 10 years from now, the energy system will look a lot like it does today. And in some ways it'll be looking, start looking quite different because it's always changing. Well, in fact, I read, uh, in fact, did an interview uh, with the Stanford uh, professor suggesting that in the U.S. market, you could have 40% of the fleet by 2030 being electric, particularly if we get the autonomous or semi-autonomous no, vehicles. No, that number's too big. That, too numbers, big. that number is just too big. It could be 40% uh, autonomous or electric. I mean, it's just, it's not going to happen. The fleet, the fleet's very big to begin with. We, it, on the world today, we have 1.3 billion. We'll have over 2 billion by 2040, and there will be electric cars in it, and maybe a growing share of autonomous. We'll see how fast that really comes in. Okay, I was gonna direct it in, into Secretary uh, Perry, though, because in the United States, it seems that the disruption's happening at a faster pace. What are your views on this and the introduction of the electric cars into the mix here? Well, I, I think it's really important. I think the, the technology, uh, you're gonna see a lot of focus on uh, smart grids, uh, on autonomous cars, uh, electric is going to be a part of that, but I tend to agree with uh, the idea that you're going to displace in the period of time that we've uh, discussed here uh, that many uh, internal combustion engine automobiles is a uh, that that's a bit of a, a fairy tale uh, that that's not going to happen. Now, are electric cars a good thing, and are you going to see a lot of focus on uh, the development of them and the uh, construction of them? Absolutely. Uh, I got to think that, uh, um, you know, a, a couple of countries that are sitting up here on the stage may be really involved in that. Uh, certainly the, the U.S. is going to be uh, deeply involved in, in the uh, development of, of, of electric. Uh, battery storage is the, the issue for me that is the most intriguing. Uh, it, it is truly the holy grail here. Uh, and, and finding the uh, the answer to battery storage, which our national labs are working on and, and very uh, diligently and private sector uh, partners working on that together. So uh, I, I just think the disruptive nature of the globe that we live in today and uh, things that, uh, uh, again, I go back to that, that peak oil thing that occurred uh, a decade plus ago, and uh, I, I don't buy into that here is what the world's going to look like 
um, in five years or in 10 years, and that, that we, we have the ability to uh, look over the horizon and see the future that clearly. It's exciting to be able to live in this world and to know that that disruption's out there and that there's some bright young man or woman somewhere uh, that's coming up with some ideas and things that we haven't even thought of yet. Great. Uh, what's the level, uh, Minister uh, Pradhan, uh, of uh, the money going into renewables in India? It's such a gigantic economy, uh, population-wise, of what almost 1.3 uh, billion people. Uh, if you look at your investment today and the reforms you're pushing, uh, what's the level of investments you're, you're dedicating now to renewable energy uh, in the spirit of what Prime Minister Modi said yesterday? As you said, uh, 175 gigawatt uh, of strategy we have planned. Out of that, 60 gigawatt we have already producing. We're investing a lot of uh, in, renewable, uh, in solar, in wind, in the biofuels, in the second generation ethanol, in bio CNG. Ulchal yesterday, Prime Minister Modi uh, raised one point. We need uh, new technology, we need uh, low cost investment. These are the challenges uh, we have, but I can cite one example few years back. The per unit uh, cost of renewable energy was a uh, few dollars. Today, it is a uh, few cents. Yes. This is the innovation technology, new capital, competition. These are the area is creating a new model and uh, with this kind of renewable intervention, I also visualize still the conventional resource will be needed, whether it is coming from cell revolution, whether it is coming from conventional fossil fuel, will be continuing to require it sizable. You are a net importer, we can depend on import, will be continuing on the reliable fields. Okay, very good. I wanted to pick off a couple of different items here uh, before we take uh, questions from the floor. Uh, number one, there's great interest in the uh, IPO in the second half of 2018. If you haven't heard, I think Saturday Aramco is looking for a, a $2 trillion valuation. Uh, is this market agreement that we have with OPEC, non-OPEC producers and this price range that we see $60, $70 make that valuation much more obtainable? Because the market seems to be very concerned about the level of price but it's applying the valuation to Saudi Aramco. Well, Saudi Aramco is a great company, first of all, I think, um, in terms of scale, in terms of uh, capabilities, in terms of what it can do. That's been well proven for uh, decades now. Uh, and, and the company will be listed uh, when the time is right. We are ready uh, from a corporate standpoint. The government has also done a lot to you know, prepare the nation also from, from a government to a company relationship. However, the valuation of Saudi Aramco is something for the markets to do. It's not for either the company or uh, the government of Saudi Arabia. And all the speculation and the numbers are, are just that, they're speculation. I would, though, you know, zoom out and, and talk about something which is not just relevant for Saudi Arabia. It's relevant for all producers, especially the big ones, who have decades, if not generations, worth of natural resources below the ground that we want to get optimum value. And uh, you them know, by, by current conservative uh, uh, calculations, we have over 260 billion barrels of oil uh, under the ground. And Aramco has an exclusive right to, uh, to, to produce most of these, and, and that will be, of course, codified through a concession agreement that will be part of the IPO uh, prospectus when it's, uh, when it's issued. But for the kingdom, for the nation, we're more interested in optimizing the value of those 260 billion barrels plus the uh, few hundred uh, trillion uh, cubic feet of gas and making sure that the markets provide us the, the optimum value for those. So, so the framework that we're talking about how to steward not only our natural resources within our borders, not only how do we manage it, not, not only how does the company operate and what is the framework and what is the contractual relationship with the state, but what is the global framework within which we market. The, 
you know, the, the, the boom and bust, the feast and famine that uh, Secretary Perry ref referred to has been proven to be destructive. It's destructive for the industry. It's destructive for consumers. I'm sure Fatih Birol worries about this as much as we do. Uh, and it's bad for jobs. Uh, it's bad for consumers to plan with if you're in the aviation industry or the shipping industry, what kind of fuel prices are, are, are we going to pay? So we want, we want to moderate that, you know, with, while living within a market framework, while allowing the private sector to lead, including a privatized or a partially listed Aramco, we want as policymakers, as global you know, citizens, we also want to uh, create a framework that hopefully will be lasting to optimize that value. And within that optimum value for consumers and, and certainly from a selfish standpoint for the government and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, Aramco will find its own fair and optimum uh, valuation. Okay. I, I sat with the Crown Prince uh, at your investment summit uh, back in October, and we didn't make up the numbers of the 5% hoping to raise $100 billion on a $2 trillion valuation. Uh, let's be candid. Is it too ambitious? Is this is a, a young Crown Prince that wanted to set the tone, uh, have an international listing, go for the top line listing, and perhaps it's too ambitious or not? Well, I, I think, first of all, you need to look at Saudi Aramco uh, uh, listing within the context of a much wider reform uh, agenda. There is a privatization of, uh, of, of uh, state-owned enterprises. There is a reaching out to the private sector, both domestic and international, to be part of the future that we're creating uh, in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And there is uh, also a determination to showcase the best of Saudi Arabia. It's people, it's enterprises, and certainly Saudi Aramco is on top of that list. So I wouldn't uh, talk about the valuation uh, as, as a single target. I mean, it's important, obviously. We, 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 we want to make sure that um, the investors that come in do recognize what they're getting into and, and, and do provide the right value. But as I said, his Royal Highness, myself, everybody else who is involved, realize that this is going to be a market-determined process. We cannot set what is the share price going to be of Saudi Aramco. Every IPO is a process of discovery of how the market perceives uh, the value of the company. And our company, Saudi Aramco, is going to be part of its valuation is the perceived value of oil. So also coming to a common understanding and making sure people realize that this is the most precious commodity that, that has powered uh, the, you know, the global uh, community to the development stage we're in today over the last uh, 120 years or so. And it's going to be with us for a long, long period of time, perhaps a longer period of time as we, uh, as, as we consume these resources uh, in an appropriate way. And I predict that with time, the value of the resources will go up, and, and hopefully that will be taken into consideration against, unfortunately, some ill-advised commentary about oil nearing um, you know, its end, which is, which is, which is very, very uh, destructive, I think, not just to the oil industry, but I think to, to, to the interest of the global community. Okay, a question to Minister Novak. You're sitting next to a, a gentleman to the left of you that represents the United States. There's sanctions on uh, Russia as we speak. Uh, how much is it hurting uh, investment or is it standing as an impediment at all in the, in the energy sector for Russia? And do you hope you can get a breakthrough here off of those sanctions? <coughs> John. I did not know what sort of questions you would be asking me, but I knew for sure you were going to ask, you were going to ask me about this one. Everybody is interested in this one. We are at the World Economic Forum, and we are discussing the global economic problems that need to be addressed. And when we talk about the sanctions, sanctions do not enable one to address global economic problems. One should understand that. As far as we are concerned, for Russia, Frankly, because of these sanctions, we, it gave our industry a certain impetus, additional impetus, and we managed to redirect the flow of, invest of investments to reboot our enterprises. To be perfectly frank, it makes us slightly uncomfortable. 
We have grown accustomed to living in a market economy. We've grown accustomed to not seeing any interference with our businesses. And now that the businesses have to look over their shoulders and look at the sanctions and think about whether someone who's following this is going to look at it in the wrong way, obviously, it make us feel slightly awkward. But in terms of investments, in terms of a moral stance, there are certain minuses in that. But I believe that after all, all of us have to strive to solve global problems of humanity, to make sure that we meet the energy demand. Because you know about the figures that 2.4 billion people don't have access to regular sources of energy, ordinary sources of energy, and all of the largest energy producers should meet this demand. We have to overcome the problem of lack of access that many countries don't have to technologies. And there are many fine examples of our cooperation in the oil sector. We have shown together with those countries that joined the cooperative accommodation with OPEC. This creates a positive economic agenda. And the good mood that you see here at the World Economic Forum in many ways is predicated on the fact that the economy is growing. And largely, what accounts for it are the steps taken to balance the market, to make the situation more stable on the market, to create more possibilities to forecast the market situation, to attract more investments. And we have to state that this effect is there. Mr. Barkindo is present here today. He took a proactive part in this initiative. And I can see that he's sitting here and listening to us. I'd like to thank him very much for taking part in this processes. We can implement such cooperation in many other areas. When we finish this joint cooperation in terms of market balancing, we already spoke with the colleagues. We need to continue our interaction. We see tangible, positive results which we can achieve in our cooperation, in developing bilateral projects, creating new technologies that would enable us more to develop our markets. One more thing I'd like to draw your attention to is that in the gas sector, we have this cooperation in the framework of the Forum of Gas Exporting Countries, where 13 or 14 countries get together that are members of this forum. So they get together and discuss everything that happens in the gas market. There are no agreements in place in terms of production or market sharing, but it is exceedingly useful and helpful. The same thing needs to be done in the oil sector, as far as the gas sector is concerned, since it has already been raised by my colleague from the left, as you mentioned, since we are sitting here together. I believe it would be helpful because the United States, for the first time in 2017, became a gas exporter. So it would be very helpful if the United States could get on board in these consultations and discussions aimed at some positive results so we can develop the markets and create an enabling environment for developing these industries so together we could do a lot more. So next year at this economic forum, we could have the very same positive mood. Uh, let's wrap it up with uh, Secretary Perry and then we'll take a couple questions from the floor. Is that an offer you can take or is that be seen as collusion with the Russians? <laughs> Um, certainly. And I don't just mean a political issue, but it's also an antitrust issue. So yeah. how do you handle it? See, the, the, we live in a competitive world. Um, I think if one of the reasons that uh, there's, uh, um, I'm, I'm certainly glad that uh, um, the professor asked us to come to participate. I'm very excited that uh, President Trump is going to be here tomorrow to address uh, all of you and the world. And uh, you know, I think one of the things people are interested in is uh, when the administration talks about America first, what does that mean? And, and I'll suggest to you, it, I, I can tell you in one word, it's, it's competition, that the United States wants to be competitive, uh, that uh, when uh, your, your country is looking for a, a place to uh, purchase uh, LNG, that you think about America first. <laughs> uh, and, 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 it's, and it's that competition that, that, that we have together. And I think it's important that we have rule of law, that we have 
uh, you know, transparency in our, in, our, in our dealings and what have you. Uh, we're, we're not always going to, to, to agree. There's going to be uh, times that uh, we're in conflict with each other. But in the grand scheme of things, sitting on this stage, being partners, being part of the, uh, the, the fossil fuel uh, producers of, of the world, uh, and it's very important that, that uh, uh, we find the places that we can work together. Uh, when I think about uh, the, these two countries and the competition that we've had before, but I also think about the places where we work together. Uh, the United States uh, is on, uh, we, we come to Russia and, and you help us uh, put our astronauts into space. And, and the, the, there's these opportunities to work together uh, to find, uh, you know, certainly, you know, the, 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 I think the future of the world is bright. Uh, I think part of that brightness is because of the competition uh, that we, we have between our countries. But at the end of the day, uh, we are part of this global uh, community and working together for a better future for the citizens of the world is really what we're all here for. Okay, very good. Thanks. Do you want to take any questions? We have some questions. We'll just be really quick. Uh, Majid Jaffer, and then we'll get a microphone to you here. And we'll go for five minutes on the questions, please. Thank you, Majid, Majid Jaffer, Crescent Petroleum in the UAE. My question is to Minister al Falah and Secretary uh, Perry, and it's about the reputation of, of the industry. We've heard a lot about the reality here, about how oil is still a very important and growing part of the mix, about how the rise of natural gas in the U.S. has not only been economically beneficial, it's lowered emissions to the yeah. lowest in 25 years. Right. Uh, and, and countries that have tried to sideline it, like Germany, have had rising emissions. But the man in the street doesn't know that. This month, the city of New York sued the, f the f five oil majors for the damage caused by the hurricane. And the New York Times uh, editorial page praised that. And John, I'm afraid CNN isn't immune. I saw last night your new eco program. You said dirty fossil fuels. And you had a picture of a nodding donkey. Yeah, I wasn't uh, and, an that. oil well. Okay. So you know, <clears throat> I think OPEC may be not communicating well enough. We as the industry, the private sector, are certainly not communicating uh, the role of our product. Uh, but what about government's role in really explaining uh, to the public uh, the importance of uh, oil and gas and that not all fossil fuels are the same? Thank you very much. Uh, let's have uh, Minister Al-Fali and, and uh, Secretary Perry. It set um, an amazing precedent that they were going to uh, sue oil companies. Aramco wasn't on that list, but it... It's almost putting it in the syntax category of alcohol and tobacco to have institutional investors not invest in oil and gas. Does this even spill into the, to, uh, the Aramco IPO if uh, people are not buying them and that's the, the image? Well, I'm sure whoever is suing um, you know, would probably uh, cry foul if they couldn't find gasoline in, uh, next door. Uh, you know, as they as they try to get to their car or the electricity was turned off because gas wasn't available. So uh, there is a lot of hypocrisy uh, in, in some quarters. And I think we have to realize that this is a part of reality. And the way to confront it, I think, is to work proactively and in a positive way rather than complain about it. So, um, you know, uh, we in the kingdom, of course, have been working through the climate change community, whether it's uh, in, in the negotiations and the COP negotiations, and we believe the Paris Agreement brings the maximum balance we could get under the circumstances of accommodating fossil fuels, of recognizing that they are part of the clean fuel uh, menu that, that will be given to, uh, to humanity for, for decades to come. The companies, we encourage Saudi Aramco and other companies to work together, and they created the OGCI uh, alliance and it was announced in the United Nations uh, Climate Summit and, and there is over a billion dollars of funds going into clean uh, technologies, mostly around oil and gas. Uh, Aramco on its own is investing a uh, significant amount of money and it's starting to make the news with breakthroughs in, in, in internal combustion and diesel engines that are going uh, to create an order of magnitude improvement in efficiency and, and and reduction in uh, carbon intensity. And this is done jointly with the auto industry. And as a result, the auto industry is starting to say, hold on, the, the, the petroleum-based fuel transportation from well to wheelbases, in many ways, depending on where the electricity 
where is, is coming from is better for the climate than the alternative solutions on offer today. The Mazda was just uh, in the news uh, a couple of days ago uh, talking about this. So I think uh, the way, Majid, to, to deal with it is not to complain to each other in places like this, but to engage with the consumers, with industry, with the public, with policymakers, and to use facts and figures and to invest in technology and communicate especially to the young people because they matter the most. Okay, Secretary Perry, well, very quickly if you can. Yeah, certainly the, um, the legal profession is always looking for a, a new and interesting angle. This looks like a, a new one and an interesting one, and I'll be one of the last people in this room to defend the New York Times. Um, so uh, the, 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 the point is this. The United States uh, is leading the world in the reduction of emissions. I happen to have been the governor of a state, the 12th largest economy in the world. We're in a standalone country, and I remind people we were at one time. Uh, but the point is that during that period of time, from the, the early parts of the 2000 to 2014, emissions went down in that 12th largest economy in the world by some 60% in, in NOx, uh, some 50% for uh, SO2. Uh, we saw uh, the emissions going down. We saw the carbon dioxide footprint go down by 20% during a period of great growth. And the story there is you can have economic development, economic growth, job growth, improved quality of life, and at the same time drive down emissions. We also, during that 14-year period of time, led the nation in the production of wind energy. We produce more wind in the state of Texas now than five countries. Those are powerful stories that need to be told around the world. And the driving force behind the biggest part of that reduction was a transition from old, inefficient power plants to cleaner burning natural gas. And that is what we want to be a part of, is what the fossil fuel industry wants to be a part of, is new technologies being able to deliver to the world cleaner burning fuels. Because the fact is, you're either going to have a world where people have to choose between keeping themselves warm or being able to have a job. And that's not an option that I think any of us want. And the fossil fuel industry will be one of the real drivers of that going into the future, led by LNG. As we see with you, our surgeon experts, I'm not going to be able to take the question from the floor, but uh, from one of our hosts here. Minister, I'll follow you. Uh, final remarks. Well, my final remarks is optimism. Um, you know, the, the market uh, globally looks good. The economy, um, as, as we've heard uh, the last couple of days, looks better than it has in more than a decade. And that is going to drive prosperity around the world. And that will spill in, into energy demand. We need to invest in the supply uh, side of the industry uh, to, to meet it. Also, technology is another uh, bright spot, innovation that is happening around the world is, uh, is accelerating and it's not going to slow down and it's going to provide some of the solutions that we're talking about, about extracting more, providing it with, 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 with better environmental uh, impact. Uh, I would end just by putting back in context what my friend Fatih Birol took out of context. I was not disputing the amazing revolution of shale, whether it's gas or oil. In fact, we're importing it into, this, into Saudi Arabia. I was simply saying that in the overall global supply demand picture, it's not going to wreck the train. We should not be scared. And I think you, that's, that's the core <laughs> job of the IEA, is not to take it out of context. And what I'm observing as I read the weekly Newswires commenting is there is an oversized focus on shale. So if there is a news item that it's going up by 50 or 100,000 barrel this week over or last month over the month before, you see an impact on the markets by 10% perhaps sometimes <coughs> or 5%. So all I'm saying is at the end of the day, as Secretary, oh, as, as Minister Novak said, if it goes from 5 to 7, 8%, we welcome it as long as we're working together and monitoring supply, demand, declines elsewhere, just like we absorbed all of the deep offshore, which came from not a dissimilar uh, technological and industrial revolution of, uh, 
of the 1980s, this will be accommodated and absorbed in a growing demand and uh, a well stewarded uh, uh, energy industry with policymakers like ourselves openly communicating, sharing information, sharing data, and taking appropriate action as in our perceived best interest. Great. Uh, nice round of applause for the panelists. I appreciate all the input. Thank you very much. My only apologies, we couldn't take more questions from the floor, but it was great analysis. Thanks very much.